Today we're going to talk about Greek mythology, but it's going to have to be a summarized version because this is a very broad topic. There is a crapload of gods, monsters and other characters, so it can get a bit overwhelming at times. We've tried to keep it relatively simple and included plenty of helpful visuals, so feel free to pause and read whenever you need to get your bearings. Okay, are you ready? Here we go! Our story starts at the very beginning of everything, the origin of the cosmos according to ancient Greek tradition, the cosmogony. Like Ian Malcolm said in Jurassic Park, everything is chaos. And by chaos, we mean a void. An infinite void was all that existed in the beginning of time. But all of a sudden, something emerged out of that void. It was the goddess Gaia, the personification of Earth. And she didn't come alone, because the chaos also spawned Eros, the god of desire, and hence eroticism. That desire was very important, since it was an essential element to start up the cosmic machinery and kick off everything that was soon to come. Eros represents the desire, the will to do things. And that's exactly what Gaia did, giving birth to Uranus, who surrounded Gaia and became the sky. After creating the heavens above, it was the turn of the underworld down below, the Tartarus. And just as Gaia had Uranus, the Tartarus had Erebus, or darkness. Then the last primeval gods to spring from chaos were the goddess Nyx, night, Hemera, day, and Aether, basically air. Nyx, in turn, produced a whole bunch of gods related to feelings, while other gods to be spawned by Gaia were Typhon, the storms, Pontus, the seas, and Aurea, the mountains. These first primordial gods gave birth to the second generation of gods. Gaia and Uranus had many children, including the Titans, Oceanus, Hyperion, Coeus, Cryus, Iapetus, and Cronus, and Titanides, Tethys, Theia, Phoebe, Themis, Nemosine, and Rhea. They also had other offspring, like the three Cyclopes, who were one-eyed giants, and then the last three were the Hecatonchires, creatures with a hundred arms and fifty heads. But it seems that Uranus wasn't really into children, and he confined them all to the Tartarus, in Gaia's entrails. This pissed off Gaia, and she urged all the Titans to rebel against their father. But only one of them had the balls to do something about it. Cronus. Okay, we need to make a quick pause here, because there is often some confusion with this name. The Cronus we're referring to here was a Titan, son of Uranus and later father of Zeus and many members of the first generation of Olympic gods, not to be mistaken with Kronos, the Greek personification of time. This confusion is largely due to the fact that they both have several possible spellings and many of them are exactly the same. But in general, the time deity is Kronos, C-H-R-O-N-O-S, whereas the Titan we're referring to is Cronus, C-R-O-N-U-S. In addition, Cronus the Titan is usually depicted with a scythe or sickle that his mother, Gaia, gave him when she urged him to free his siblings from their tyrannical father, Uranus. That scythe symbolizes his condition as primordial god of agriculture and bringer of wealth. It has nothing to do with death and the passage of time. Got that? Yes? Okay, let's continue then. As we were saying, Cronus was the only titan with the balls to rebel against his father. And it was all about balls, because one day, while Uranus was giving Gaia a good going over, Cronus crept up on them and castrated him. <coughs> Uranus's balls went flying off as he spurted blood and semen everywhere. Out of those juices spilt on the earth sprung new gods, like the Erinys, the three goddesses of vengeance, and also the Gigantes, and the nymphs of the forest, the Meliads the most important of which was Melia. But not all of Uranus's junk was spilt on Earth. Some of it fell on the ocean, where it formed a foam, which then gave birth to Aphrodite, goddess of beauty, love and reproduction. After castrating his father, Cronus freed his siblings and banished Uranus. Unfortunately, he proved to be just as tyrannical as his father, locking up the Cyclopes and Hecatonchires in the Tartarus. Next, he married his sister Rhea, also called Cybele in Phrygia, and this union produced the third generation of gods. But when these new gods were about to come along, Gaia warned Cronus that one of his children would take his place as supreme god, just like he had done with his own father. And so, as the babies were born, Cronus ate them one by one. Baby, it's what for dinner! First was Hestia, goddess of homes and architecture. Then Demeter, goddess of agriculture. Hera, goddess of marriage. Hades, god of the underworld. And Poseidon, god of the seas. 
However, just as she began to give birth to a sixth child, Zeus, Rhea decided to save him. So she gave Cronus a rock wrapped in a blanket. The trick worked and Cronus ate the rock, believing it was the last child. A delicious looking limestone rock. Mm. Rhea then hid Zeus in the caves of the island of Crete, and there he was raised by the nymphs of the forest and a goat called Amalthea. He was also protected by the Curetes, magical beings who danced around and made loud noises so that Cronus wouldn't hear baby Zeus crying. At this same time, there were many liaisons between the titans. For example, Oceanus and Tethys got jiggy with it and had plenty of offspring, including the rivers and the Oceanids, the most famous of which were Metis, Asia, Electra, Clymene and Styx. Then Hyperion and Theia produced Eos, the dawn, Helios, the sun, and Selene, the moon. Coios and Phoebe produced Leto and Asteria. Leto would later get it on with Zeus and give birth to Apollo and Artemis, while her sister Asteria refused to have anything to do with Zeus and turned into an island to avoid him. Oh, look at that. Ay. For their part, Iapetus and Asia sired Prometheus, Epimetheus and Atlas, who would later have his own children, including Calypso and various other nymphs like the Pleiades and the Hesperides, protectors of the famous garden of the Hesperides. Meanwhile, with Uranus out of commission, Gaia coupled with Pontus and had Forthys, Seto, a monstrous whale, hence the term Cetacean, Eurybia and the so-called Sea Elders, Nereus, who had 50 daughters known as the Nereids, the nymphs of the sea, and Thaumas, who would marry Electra and produce Iris, goddess of the rainbow, Arche and the Harpies, horrible winged monster ladies. The union between the titan Cryus and the pontid Euribia produced Astraeus, god of astrology. Here it's worth mentioning his child, Boreas, god of the northern wind, who was thought to live with his immortal children in the land of Hyperborea, an unexplored territory beyond Thrace. Another pair of siblings who got together were Forces and Seto, producing Scylla, a sea creature, Ladon, a dragon with a hundred heads, Thusa, a nymph resembling a mermaid who later coupled with Poseidon to give birth to the Cyclops Polyphemus, the Gryia, three old crones who shared a single eye and a single tooth, and the Gorgons, creatures so horrible that you would turn to stone if you looked at them. And they may have also produced the mermaids. Their last daughter was Echidna, who married Typhon and birthed some of the most famous monsters in Greek mythology, including the three-headed dog Cerberus, Orthrus, the Chimera, the Sphinx, the Hydra of Lerna, the Lion of Nemea, the Eagle of Prometheus, the Dragon of Colchis, and the Sow of Chromion. In a future episode we will see how Hercules killed many of these monsters, only to then get busy with their mother, Echidna, and produce more offspring. Yep, Greek mythology is very misogynistic and can get very freaking weird. During the reign of Cronus, there appeared, apparently created by Prometheus, a race of happy men who did not work, lived of the fruits of the land and never aged. This was known as the Golden Age of Man, since these first humans were almost like gods, always strong and enjoying carefree lives. It is said that these lucky lot lived in a region of the Peloponnesus called Arcadia, which was basically like a paradise on earth. I'm so glad we came to paradise. But Cronus was still a mean tyrant, so it was just a matter of time until his son Zeus rebelled against him and the other titans. Once Zeus became older, he managed to trick his father into drinking a potion prepared by Metis, which made him vomit all his siblings, and together they fought a war known as the Titanomachy, the War of the Titans. After ten years of intense battle, Zeus defeated the Titans on the plains of Thessaly. Then he locked them up in the Tartarus once again and established a new cosmic order. But it seems that this new plan had no place for immortal humans, so Zeus turned them all into daemons, or protective spirits who would serve as guides to the Tartarus for the next race of humans that he then created. This was the Silver Age of Man. In addition, Zeus freed the Hecatonchires, who then became the jailers of the Titans, and also the Cyclopes, who thanked the gods for their freedom by forging weapons for them. For Zeus, they made thunder and lightning. For Hades, a helmet of darkness that turned him invisible. And for Poseidon, a trident. Meanwhile, Atlas, the leader of the Titans, was condemned to hold the heavens in what is known as the Atlas Range, which runs through northern Morocco and Algeria.
The Titanomachy finally brought peace to the world, but alas, it wouldn't last for long. Zeus had to deal with two uprisings instigated by his own grandmother Gaia. She was mad about the imprisonment of the Titans, so she set the Gigantes against Zeus and his crew. After some intense battling, the gods beat the Gigantes and then came the second uprising, headed by Typhon and known as the Typhonomachy. This creature, with 100 fire-breathing dragon and snake heads, was a tough opponent, but Zeus eventually prevailed and cast Typhon into the depths of the Tartarus, sealing the pit with Mount Etna. For the Greeks, this was the reason why it sometimes spewed lava. They didn't know it was a volcano. Now Zeus was finally triumphant and decided to settle his royal court in Mount Olympus, located in Thessaly. From that place in the high heavens, Zeus ruled the world, giving his brother Poseidon power over the seas and Hades over the underworld, the resting place of the dead. Along with them were Hera, Zeus's legitimate wife, Athena, Demeter, Hestia, Apollo, Artemis, Ares, Hermes, Aphrodite and Hephaestus, known as the Twelve Olympic Gods. And if you're wondering, where did all this lot come from? Well, it turns out that Zeus was a horny dog and spent all his time chasing every female in sight. Officially, his legitimate wife was his sister Hera, goddess of marriage. She was from the region of Arcadia, and Zeus seduced her in the shape of a cuckoo. From this union came Ares, god of war and brute strength, Hebe, goddess of youth, and Aletheia, goddess of birth, and maybe also Hephaestus, god of forges and metallurgy, but the story of his origin is not entirely clear. But now we have to delve into Zeus's extramarital affairs, which were plenty. With Metis, he was going to have a baby. But then an oracle told Zeus to be wary, for one of Metis' children would take his throne. So then Zeus, seeing that history was going to repeat itself, decided to eat Metis, which was exactly the same thing his father had done in the same situation. Go figure. But then he started to suffer massive headaches, and so Hephaestus, with the best of intentions, split his head with an axe to relieve the pain. I guess it makes sense, kinda. That is without a doubt the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Well, next thing you know, out of Zeus's open skull, uttering a battle cry, sprang forth a grown-up Athena, goddess of wisdom, battles, strategy, and civilization, who would soon become his father's favorite daughter. Athena was also the protector of Athens, hence the city's name. Zeus then got in bed with Leto, who gave birth to Apollo, the pretty boy of Olympus, god of the sun, music, and medicine, and who later passed on all that knowledge to his own son, Asclepius. Apollo was born in the island of Delos and later established the Oracle of Delphos because he was into divination and soothsaying and all that new age kind of stuff. But first he had to kill the giant snake Python. I hate snake shark! I hate him! Leto also birthed Artemis, goddess of hunting and nature. The Olympic handyman, Hephaestus, was tasked with creating the arrows for the powerful bows of Apollo and Artemis. The fastest god, Hermes, Olympic messenger and patron of commerce, and also of thieves, figures, was born from the union between Zeus and Maia, the eldest of the Pleiades we saw earlier. He also invented the pipes and always carried them with him, along with his staff. One day, he used this staff to separate two quarreling snakes, which then coiled onto it, and that was the origin of the Caduceus, the symbol of heralds and commerce. Not to be mistaken with the staff of Asclepius, the symbol of medicine. Later, Hermes and Aphrodite would have a child together, Hermaphrodite, who had both genders. But we're not yet done with Zeus's affairs. Not by a long stretch. He also seduced Demeter, thus siring Persephone, who was later abducted by Hades to be his queen of the underworld. This is important because it originated one of the key rites in Greek religion, the Eleusinian Mysteries, which celebrated the arrival of Persephone from Hades in the spring and her return to the underworld in winter. That is how the ancient Greeks interpreted the cycle of the seasons, in terms of the moods of the goddess of agriculture. And Zeus had many more flings. Like with Themis, the titanity of justice, resulting in the Horai, the goddesses of seasons, and perhaps also the three Moirai, goddesses of destiny. Later, he got in the sack with Nemosine, goddess of memory, resulting in the nine muses, who represented various aspects of creativity. 
And not yet happy with all this, Zeus even found time to chase mortal females, like Semele, with whom he fathered Dionysus, god of wine, enjoyment and theatre, Achmene, who would give birth to Heracles, the greatest hero in Greek mythology, and also Danae, siring Perseus, Thalia, siring Palici, Europa, siring Minos, Laudamia, siring Sarbidon, Callisto, siring Arcas, Cariope, siring Coibantes, and the list goes on and on and on. Understandably, Hera was completely fed up with Zeus's shenanigans. She was jealous and vengeful, and with reason. So one day she decided to have a child all by herself. This was Hephaestus, who was deformed, and so she cast him away from Olympus. In revenge, Hephaestus built her a magnificent golden throne, which his mother was delighted with. But when Hera sat on it, she was stuck. In the end, Dionysus had to intervene. He got Hephaestus drunk and made him free her. Later, they kissed and made up, but since we've mentioned Dionysus, it's worth explaining that Hera normally paid her jealousy with the women that her husband seduced, but other times she would pick on their children. For example, she made the Titans tear apart Dionysus and boil him in a cauldron. Lucky for him, his grandmother Rhea resurrected him, and Zeus then had to hide him away for a while, transforming him into a goat. An unpleasant incident took place when Hera tried to stage a coup together with the other Olympic gods. They tied up Zeus while he was sleeping, but the Hecatonchires came to his aid and freed him. In revenge for this, Zeus hung Hera from the skies for a very long time, while Apollo and Poseidon were sentenced to hard labour, building the mythical walls of Troy. Inachus, an Oceanid son of Tethys and Oceanus, and first king of Argos, had several children with the nymph Melia, namely Foroneus, Agilius, Mycene, and Io. This last daughter also had a fling with Zeus. When Hera found out, she turned Io into a cow and left her with the giant Argus Panoptes, who was a great guardian because he had 100 eyes. Zeus sent Hermes to save her, and he did it by putting the giant to sleep with his music and then killing him. But then Hera found out and sent a horsefly to pester Io the cow, which then ran off, crossing the Bosphorus, meaning ox passage, and reaching Egypt, where Zeus found her, turned her back into a human so he could get busy with her, resulting in the birth of Epaphus, who would later become the Egyptian god Apis, while Io herself became Isis. And you're probably thinking, Egyptian gods? What do they have to do with the Greeks? The answer is, nothing really. But the Greeks were very syncretistic, and they liked to think about the origin of their neighbor's gods, but always through the lens of their own mythology. For the Greeks, all the gods from other cultures originated from the gods that they themselves worshipped. And since we've veered off topic, we might as well address something that came up after posting the original video in the Spanish channel. In the comments, many of you asked, Hey, where is Kratos? In reference to the protagonist of the God of War video game saga. Well, you may be interested to know that, although he has nothing to do with that character, there was indeed a god named Kratos in Greek mythology. He was the son of the titan Pallas and the oceanid Styx, and was considered the personification of male strength and power. And he fought on the side of the Olympic gods in both the Gigantomachy and Titanomachy. And now let's return to Mount Olympus. After transforming the Golden Age humans into protective spirits, Zeus created the Silver Age humans, who were nowhere near as cool. In fact, they were mostly treated as outcasts. Lucky for them, they had a powerful friend, the titan Prometheus, who had been allowed to remain free as a reward for helping Zeus in the battle against the other titans. But this would prove troublesome, because his number one hobby was messing with Zeus. His first trolling was when Zeus decided that humans should make sacrifices to the gods. Prometheus let him choose first which part of the sacrificial ox he preferred, but he had previously placed all the delicious bits in the animal's entrails, which were disgusting, and wrapped all the inedible parts, like the bones, in the tasty fat. Naturally, Zeus chose the second option, and when he realized he had been tricked by the titan, he got so mad that he took fire away from the humans in revenge. Prometheus then decided to steal the fire, which was guarded by Hephaestus, and return it to the humans. Of course, they were extremely grateful, but this made Zeus even angrier. As a punishment, he sent among the humans the first woman, Pandora, carrying with her a mysterious box. And when the girl opened that box, all the evils of mankind came out of it. Aging, disease, pain, madness, misery, passions, vices. Only one thing remained at the very bottom of the box. Hope, the last thing we lose. This was a pivotal moment for humans, who thus arrived at the third age of mankind, the age of the men of bronze. 
when we started to exterminate each other in wars driven by our passions and greed. From this point onwards, when human beings died, they were transported to the underworld. After passing away, Hermes, or the forest spirits, guided the soul of the deceased person up to a lake, where they boarded the boat of Charon, the ferryman, who had to be paid for his work. Which is why, when the Greeks buried their dead, they placed coins under the tongue or on the eyes of the corpse. And here we have to make another brief pause. Apparently, only the first is correct. The tradition in ancient Greece was to place one coin under the tongue of the deceased person. It seems that the coins on the eyes are more of a Hollywood thing. The reason for the coin was that Charon interrogated the dead souls before ferrying them over to the underworld. And since those souls had no voice, when they opened their mouths to try to answer, the only thing that would come out would be the coin, and so Charon would receive his payment. Now back to our story. The end of the journey was guarded by Cerberus, a monstrous three-headed dog which prevented the living from entering. Once in the underworld, the souls were judged by King Minos, his brother Radamanthus, and Aeacus, king of Aegina. This trio decided your eternal fate. If you had been a virtuous man or a great warrior, you would go to the Elysian Fields. If you had been an asshole, you were sentenced to the Tartarus. And if you had been just a regular guy, then you went to the Asphodel Meadows. Now let's leave the underworld and return to the surface. Where Zeus was so angry with Prometheus that he chained him up in the Caucasus and had an eagle eat his liver during the day only to have it regenerate during the night and remain in an infinite cycle of pain. Meanwhile, Foroneus, son of the river god Inachus, took over a small village which would later become the city of Argos. He managed to civilize humanity and also taught them how to make fire, which they had lost after the whole Promethean debacle. It is said that Foroneus was the first to build a city and that during his reign, Hermes taught humans how to speak in various different tongues. Another son of Inachus was Aegialius, who founded the city-state of Sicyon. One of his daughters, Niobe, slept with Zeus, and who didn't, and gave birth to Argus and Pelasgus. More on him in a moment. Foroneus also had Apis, who later ruled Egypt, and Kar, who founded the city of Megara. Pandora, the box opener, ended up marrying Epimetheus, brother of Prometheus, and having a girl called Pyrrha, who later married her own cousin, the son of Prometheus and Clymene, Deucalion. Over in the region of Attica, Acteus became the first king, and his successor, Cecrops, founded the city of Athens. Pelasgus, the child of Zeus and Niobe, ruled Arcadia, and his son, Lycon, caused a lot of trouble for all humans. After inheriting the throne of Arcadia, he got a bit carried away with his devotion to Zeus, and ended up making human sacrifices and serving their flesh to him. When Zeus found out what Lycon had done, he punished him by turning him into history's first werewolf, and that is where the term Lycanthrope comes from. But things didn't end there, because his 50 children were no better than their father. And eventually, Zeus got so fed up with all their bull I mean wolf crap, that he decided to send a great flood to destroy all the men of the Bronze Age. At that time, Deucalion was visiting his chained father Prometheus, who told him about Zeus's plan. So Deucalion and his wife and cousin Pyrrha built a large wooden chest to save themselves. The flood didn't really end up destroying everything. There were several survivors, but Deucalion and Pyrrha made generous offerings to Zeus and he forgave them and granted them a wish. They asked for humanity to be restored, and this was done by casting rocks over their heads, which turned into new men and women. This would be the last race of humans, the men of iron, ourselves. I am Iron Man. Deucalion and Pyrrha also had several children, Protogonia, Amphictyon, and Helen, from whom the demon in Hellenic is derived, and whose three children founded the three main Greek tribes, Dorians, Ionians, and Aeolians. While all this was going on, Zeus went back to his exploits. He transformed into a bull to abduct the Phoenician princess Europa, and from this tryst were born King Minos, Radamanthus, and Sarpedon. Europa's brother Cadmus looked for her all over Greece, eventually reaching the region of Boeotia, where he founded a fortress that became the city of Thebes. Later, after killing Aris's pet dragon, he was punished, but eventually he was forgiven and married Aris's daughter Harmonia. At this time, things were starting to change, and the gods got gradually less involved in earthly matters. Greece was about to enter the age of heroes, who were mainly the children that Zeus had with human women. These were the demigods, whose adventures we will see in a future episode. And the rest is history. If you enjoyed this video, don't forget to subscribe to the channel and leave us a big like. Take care and I'll see you in the next video.